So last month I hiked to Mount Everest base camp. It was the physically and mentally hardest thing I've ever done, the most challenging by far. In this video, I'm going to share the story of how it happened and also tips and itinerary and packing list in case you are interested in going on the same adventure. Who am I? I'm Mana. I'm an adventure travel photographer and creator. And if you have two seconds, it would mean a lot to me if you could subscribe down below. It helps support me a lot to create more videos like this. Now let's get into it. Okay, so I have everything listed off here in this Notion document on my laptop of everything you need to know to go to Everest Base Camp. So first of all, how do you get there? You reach Everest Base Camp by flying to Nepal to Kathmandu to start. And so basically what I did is my route was flying Qatar Airways for 14 and a half hours from Los Angeles to Doha, Qatar. I had a five hour layover there and then I flew four and a half hours from Doha to Kathmandu. It's quite the journey. When you land in Kathmandu, you feel like you've transported into a totally different different reality. It's dusty and it's dirty and it's rough, but if you stick that out, you find so much magic in Nepal that you would have never expected or guessed to be there. It's unlike anything I've experienced before. So we traveled to Nepal on March 21st, and this was just a few days before Holi. So we ended up staying right in the tourist district and celebrating Holi as well. I was with one female friend and one male friend, so a group of three. And I definitely would not recommend going to Holi as a solo female traveler. Even with a group, it still felt unsafe at times. So definitely make sure to go as a group. Trust your instinct and stay in the public areas. So after we celebrated Holi, we went to Pokhara for a bit. We originally were thinking of hiking the Annapurna circuit and we still did do a day hike there. There are plenty of guides or you can go on your own. Uh, but then spontaneously and magically, a friend texted me a contact for a guide that he hiked to Everest Base Camp with the previous year, had an amazing experience with. And I was like, okay, let me just text him and see what happens. And Lakpa immediately answered he sent us an entire itinerary for a private trekking tour for my friend Diana and I to hike to Everest Base Camp. What? Talk about synchronicities. Talk about alignment. Everything was flowing. And we were like, okay, is this our sign? Do we do it? Do we hike to Everest Base Camp? And I captured all the videos of the actual vlog footage of us like realizing all of this and actually deciding to do it. So if you want to see that, I will link that video here for you to check out. That shows like the raw, real, authentic moment by moment of us actually on the journey. This is me telling you about it. So our guide, Lakpa, was the absolute best. He coordinated everything for us to the point where all we had to do was wake up and eat and walk <laughs> and of course like get past those mental struggles of being with such high elevation and lack of oxygen and freezing and all those things but i would so strongly recommend lakpa he's amazing and i will put his email address down below tell him i sent you so lakpa basically informed us that the previous week they had stopped flights from Kathmandu to lukla which is the airport that you go to to fly or to hike to mount everest and so we had to take a transfer a car for four hours from Kathmandu to another airport from Kathmandu to Molkot and it was a very rough like developing road severe motion sickness for anyone like me who gets motion sickness and there at that airport we slept and then the first day we began queuing and what we learned is that it's basically a process to even try to fly to Lukla because what we learned is that um, in the spring months, so when we were there in March, April, there's a lot of burning going on of the crops. So that makes the air quality very, very smoky and hazy and polluted. And it's also because of where Nepal is located, like in the mountains, in the valley, there's basically no like air being cleaned. So you're just like sitting in this dense haze so that makes it so that almost every single flight is canceled so there had already been three or four days of people's flights being canceled so hundreds of people at this tiny tiny airport trying to get on their flight to lukla so that's the number one thing that you need to know to even get to the trailhead is that you need an investment of time and patience and so the first day didn't happen so we went to sleep right by the airport uh, at this hotel and then we woke up the next day we were supposed to be on the first flight out delayed 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 we were there at like 
4 or 5 a.m., delayed, delayed. And then, great news. They were like, okay, we're going to send one flight. So we went. We got so excited, sat on the flight, flew 90% of the way there, and then circled back because the visibility was zero. And the Lukla airport is known as the most dangerous airport in the world. And so we didn't want to take any chances. The, air, the pilot didn't want to take any chances. So super disappointing, but we came all the way back. And at that point, there were hundreds of people there trying to get their flight, the new people that had arrived that day, the four days of flights that were canceled. And so then then they um, present this option of taking helicopters. It's $500 US dollars per person to go on a helicopter from Mulcott to Lukla. So we teamed up with three other people from a different tour company. We all got a helicopter and we went and it was the craziest helicopter ride of my life. The visibility was close to zero. It was kind of drizzling. It was super hazy. It was truly one of those moments where you're just like trusting your intuition and the greater forces and the divine and God. And it, it was wild, but eventually we made it and it added one hour extra to our trek. Um, but that's okay because we were just so happy to be there and to be able to try to start this hike. And honestly, because of all of these complications, there's literally no way we could have figured this all out ourselves. So I would 100% go recommend going with a local guide. You're not only supporting like a local Nepali Sherpa person, but you're also going to be so much more advantaged for knowing what's happening. We So we didn't get to experience the Lukla airport on the way there, but we did experience the most dangerous airport in the world on the way back. And it's terrifying. It's basically the runway is located like in this mount on a mountain basically 45 degree angle off the side of a mountain and it's it's really one of those like <laughs> universe take the wheel type experiences absolutely wild so anyways that's how we actually got there to start the hike and you can definitely like once you land start to feel that the air the oxygen is just thinner and i would say that is the most challenging part of hiking to everest base camp is the lack of oxygen um, because even if you're a fit person, even if you're so strong, exercise so much, there's there's a level of difficulty that the lack of oxygen, it not only makes your brain functioning slower and difficult, different, but you're also like, everything just feels heavier and slower. And so then this was our itinerary. So um, the recommended ideal duration for the Everest Space Camp Trek is typically around 12 to 14 days. So like I said before, it's an investment of time that you need as well to go to Everest. Um, so this is the high level itinerary. And I'll put a screenshot here of what our itinerary looked like, including the delays at the beginning because of um, the flight delays. And keep in mind that we not only hiked to Everest Space Camp, but we also added Chola Pass and Gokyo Lake. So this made our trek a total of 14 days of hiking and a total of 20 days recommended to make the itinerary work. So real talk about Chola Pass and Gokyo Lake. I would not recommend adding those unless you're going to unless you're looking to go off the beaten path in the Himalayas. Those parts, like, imagine we had already reached Everest Base Camp, which is the hardest thing I had ever done. And then you're going to even higher elevation, more challenging, more cold. You push into a level of mental strength and tenacity that you will not believe that you have. So unless you're looking to do that and really get off the beaten path and off the sort of tourist path, and it's all relative because anyone who goes to Everest is still already like an adventurous person. Um, but honestly, for those parts, I was exhausted. I was freezing. I was running on fumes. I didn't know I had. And at multiple points, I thought, oh, my gosh, are they going to have to helicopter rescue me? Like, it really took some next level pushing through. So I would not recommend adding those unless you are really, really looking for an intense added adventure. Um, and so here's a screenshot, like I said before, and it includes the itinerary, the day, the date, the program, the altitude in meters, and the distance in approximate hours. Um, so the first couple days is you're going from Kathmandu to Lukla, you trek to Pakding, and then day three to four, you trek to Namche Bazar. And Namche Bazar is basically like the last big sort of commercial tourist shopping center. You can get massages. Um, there are some bars there, a lot of souvenirs. So surprising because you're in the middle of the Himalaya mountains, um, but they have a lot of helicopters that come in and out of there very often to bring in these sort of supplies and replenish. We got some massages there, Tibetan massages and energy reading. That was 
the best massage I've ever had. Would strongly recommend. And you can also get the last like cash there. So there are ATMs there、um, to get cash for buying things like water and food at the tea houses and stuff as you go along the trail. So Namche Bazaar is the place to sort of stock up, and it's your last chance to get if you need like spare gloves or sunglasses or hat or if you lose anything like that's where you can get it in Namche Bazaar. And also important to keep in mind that a lot of the things that you see, like North Face or、uh, like all these big name brands, ninety nine percent of them are knockoffs. So just be aware of the quality of it. But it looks pretty dang real.、It、looks like the real thing. But just be aware of that. And then day five to six,、um, acclimatization day in Namche Bazaar. Day seven to eight, trek to Tangboche. Day nine to ten. Trek to Dingboche and an acclimatization day, and these acclimatization days are very, very important because even if you feel like, oh, great, I'm going, I'm hiking, it's good, I can hike four days in a row, no problem. Why do I need to stop? It's because of the lack of oxygen. You need to give your blood and your body and your cells a chance to adapt to those different levels of oxygen. So that's what the acclimatization day is for, and it's recommended that on those days you rest or you do like the day hike、um, to sort of you go up in elevation. And then down, sleep. Try to rest as much as you can. Replenish. Drink plenty of water and eat food.、Um, so that's what the, our acclimatization days look like. And then you have the trek to Labuche, and then trek to Gorakshep, which is the last big tea house before Everest Base Camp. Gorakshep is definitely the roughest. It was my lowest point. There were probably 200 people. In that tea house lodge, that's meant for forty people, and they're burning like yak poop. I think it is in the main、um, sort of fireplace. And so imagine this: it's like this small, situated sort of closed tea house, and there's so much smoke, and there's already a lack of oxygen. The oxygen levels at Everest Base Camp are fifty percent of what they are at sea level, and everyone's breathing out their carbon monoxide. And you feel like my head at times felt like it was a like that feeling of like a teapot that's about to explode. Like that's how my head felt. <laughs> and then the only other option you have is to go into your room in the tea house, and the rooms somehow feel colder than it is outside. And、the、at that point, you're sleeping、like、a on a glacier, like, like you're in a glacier. It's a level of cold、much. that I have <laughs> never、so、experienced before. And but then that's the only option. That's the only retreat. It's like. There's a gust of wind outside, and you somehow feel it inside. But hey, it's all part of the adventure. I'm not complaining here. I'm just saying it how it is.、Um, but yeah, so that's basically what it looks like. And then you do the trek to Everest Base Camp, and then do your whole journey back to Lukla, or continue as we did. So that's generally what the itinerary looks like. So, what is the best time to visit to hike Everest Base Camp in Nepal? So the best season for trekking, so the pre monsoon season, is. March to May,、um, from what I understood, April into May is the most popular time for Everest ascents. So for people who are going all the way up to Mount Everest,、um, which, by the way, I've learned there's a lot of controversy in actually hiking up to Mount Everest. It's basically just like whoever can pay for it. A lot of the times, not actual mountaineers or nature lovers or adventure lovers.、Um, there's a lot of controversy in it. So definitely do your own research in it. I personally don't think I will ever be hiking up. To Mount Everest, just because of everything that my guide told me that we learned, the strain, the risks, the danger. I'm very proud of my accomplishment hiking to Everest Base Camp, and we'll probably keep it at that. Um, and then, so the po- post monsoon season there is late September to November. So those are the most popular windows people go for、um, trekking. So March to May, and then September, late September to November.、Um, And then this is another thing that we learned as well is with the weather forecasting in Nepal, they don't have their forecasting systems set up to what you might be used to in the rest of the world, and also like the elements of being in the mountains.、Um, that's where a lot of the tragedies on Mount Everest have come from: is that they can't predict when an avalanche will happen or when a storm will come in. And that's what can make it be so dangerous. And so, I would strongly, strongly recommend. And I'll pack. I'll discuss more in the packing section. But that's why layers are so necessary to have on you at all times, because the weather can change like that. Sharpest icy wind you've ever experienced can come out of nowhere, and it's super important to be prepared for that. So, like I said earlier, we went to Nepal from March twenty second to April fourteenth. And I'd say we were just ahead of the peak Everest Base Camp crowds. 
On our way down the mountain, we saw huge crowds of tours and groups and people coming up. And honestly, we were really thankful that we didn't have that experience with so many people. Somehow, I think we were just in front of the peak window. And even though that might have meant that we faced like more difficult weather, colder weather, it still, I was grateful to it than having all of the crowds. Um, because like I said earlier, especially close to Everest Base Camp, it was crowded and uncomfortable. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, because of the haze and smoke as well, that's something to uh, prepare for when you go to Kathmandu. And it was also in Pokhara was all of the dense, dense smoke and haze. But thankfully, in the Everest region, it seems that there are protection measures in place for this not to happen. Um, but still, everybody recommends having a neck gaiter or a buff um, to have on you, especially as you get closer to Mount Everest, because there's this thing called the Everest cough. And that tea house at Gorakshep sounded like a sick house because everybody was coughing and sneezing and it's basically because of the cold, the wind, and something about like the iciness into your lungs and also the dust, because it's all glaciers and rocks and dust that you're inhaling. Um, that's really, really bad for your lungs. And so they recommend to always be hiking. And you'll see in my vlog that I always, when possible, have my mouth and my nose covered so that you can create moisture. So you're breathing in at least a little bit of humidity and not just pure, dry, smoky dust. Um, and then packing essentials. So I'm now I'm going to cut to a clip of me in Nepal on the Everest Base Camp trek, sharing everything I packed between my backpack and my Sherpa bag. So this is something to keep in mind as well. So the tour was private between Diana and I. We had one guide who was guiding us the whole time. And then we had one um, Sherpa porter who was amazing. And he was the one who carried our larger packs and basically like would have those at the tea house as we got to each place. And I know that there's a lot of controversy around, oh, like, is it ethical to have people carry your bags and everything? But the way that I looked at it is that it's still happening. It's still a tourist economy there. And I would rather support like a local person a local uh, economy and stimulate the economy and still have this experience and that's the only way I was really able to do it there's no way that I could have carried all of my stuff and gone for this hike and so mad respect and gratitude for our guide and Sherpa and so yeah for packing remember that layers are key having proper hiking boots with good traction like I would say lightweight hiking boots with good traction I wore my Teva hiking boots and I had my Teva hiking sandals for recovery hiking poles, altitude sickness medicine, hat and gloves, and a neck gaiter to cover your lungs. And then that's what I recommend. I'll cut to the video. Okay, so now let's talk food. What did the food look like on the Everest Space Camp trek? So if you haven't heard of Dal Bot before, you will quickly, quickly learn what it is because that's what we had for basically every single meal, every single day of the 14 days on the hike. So what is Dal Bot? Dal Bot is rice with lentils and vegetables. So this is the Dal Bot. Dal Bot, good power, 24 hours, no toilet, no shower. <laughs> So where do you get your energy? <laughs> Good energy, yeah. Good energy. Oh. Wow. <laughs> no meat. This is the safest and most nutritious option to eat along the trail. Um, in my daily vlogs, you can see me showing the doll bot. I would not recommend eating meat. Very, very hard because I am a meat lover um but everything that's served in the tea houses is mostly taken up and down the mountain the only way to take it up and down the mountain is via a porter and just for like making sure that you are not getting sick or any type of food poisoning we did have a couple of friends get food poisoning um along the trail which was very sad and so stick to doll bot as much as possible and then another thing that saved me by the way was bringing in my own go macro bars so they say that one of the symptoms of altitude sickness is that you no longer have any appetite to eat anything. I experienced this the day that we got to Everest Space Camp. I didn't want to eat any dal bot. I didn't want to eat any rice, any eggs. All of it seemed nauseating for me. I didn't have an appetite. The only thing that I was sort of forcing myself to eat was my Go Macro chocolate bars. I was taking like small bites of those. I would also bring the goo sort of like hydration, uh, the electrolyte packs, the little goo things you can get our at REI 
and liquid IV electrolytes, life savers for me. So having those, strongly recommend bringing enough, at least one for every single day. Um, and then I also would recommend to, they have water bottles for sale. Um, and so it is really good to take things like life straw so you can sort of recycle and not waste water bottles when you're traveling. But our guide recommended us that the tea houses like Gorak Ship that are not as clean, do not use those. Use Buy new water bottles. And also with the water bottles, you can put your electrolytes in there. Um, rather don't do that rather than using the purification tablets due to the poor water quality. Yeah. So next I want to talk about health and safety. So I recommend the first thing to do is to get a travel insurance that covers high altitude trekking. I personally used safe trip from United healthcare global. This isn't sponsored. This is just what I used. Um, and then drink more water than you think you need to. Hydration is absolutely key. And so what I did for my water system is I had my life straw water bottle. I had a plastic water bottle that I would buy each day and put my liquid IV into it. And then I had my water bladder, which is the one that you wear on your back with a straw. And I would like take sips of that all the time. Also drinking mink, mint tea and they had lemon ginger honey everywhere, which is amazing. That's so good for the throat for trying to combat that Everest cough. Um, so I drink that multiple times a day and I also recommend bringing vitamins and also going slow. So our guide built out the itinerary in the way that he did to provide us with acclimatization days to adjust as we are increasing with altitude. The number one piece of advice I would give is to focus on one step in front of the other, just one step at a time. There's something about being in the Himalayas, about doing this trek that just pulls and grounds you into the present moment. A couple of times, especially close to base camp, I found myself mentally slipping. It's so much more of a mental battle than anything physical. I am a very like fit, healthy person. I love to hike and exercise and surf. Smiling, like, but no level of physical activity, I think, so could have prepared me if my mindset wasn't ready. Because when you're in those Himalaya mountains, you sort of can start to feel trapped, especially when the oxygen is low and you're out there. I would work on your resilience mindset, things like cold plunges, ice baths, where your meditation, where you're really training your mind and then also training your body. So I did biohacking, um, like things like the atmospheric cell trainer. There's an oxygen deprivation tank, expands and contrasts your cells. I don't know all the science of it. I think that that really, really helped me. I would go to Dave Asprey's upgrade labs in Santa Monica, which is now closed. So I'm looking for a new biohacking gym, but that's what I personally did. I really believe. 90% of it was mindset. Although we did see some people that were not physically fit, very clearly should not have been there. And I would say, know your limits. Do not go to one of the most challenging hikes in the world if you're not physically fit. Like, not, I'm not trying to say, oh, the fitness is not important. It is important, but it's nothing without the mindset as well. And so know your limits. Don't go if you're not fit or ready um, because that puts a strain on the locals having to rescue. We saw many helicopter rescues happening while we were out there. And it's that's just very, very dangerous and sort of disrespectful to the locals. Um, and then so the highlights and experiences of my journey, because I feel like I've been very serious in sharing this whole time. This was my proudest realization from the trek. And my name is Monica Fori. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. and now living in Santa Monica, California. And my why forever is base camp has been the most guided journey of my life. It's felt like all of my ancestors have guided me here. And what I've discovered is that my body can do anything my mind decides as long as it's in alignment with my heart. This whole journey has been affirming of that. And then also coming from a place of love. The heart just broke a little bit, but honestly, I think that gives it character because like no one's perfect, nothing's perfect. And that's the beauty of life. And that's the beauty of this journey. And I feel so grateful to be here experiencing it in such a powerful place. Like the energy of Everest is just like, I've never felt anything like it before. And yeah, just feeling really, really grateful. Bye. <laughs> is that my physical body can do anything my mind decides if it's in alignment with the heart. 
That's what came up for me the entire time as we were ascending. Breathwork puts you into altered states of consciousness. And as we were ascending into different quantum grids, it literally became different realities. And this is sort of my number one download that came to me is how capable we are as human beings, how capable I am. The levels of cold, the lack of oxygen, the hiking, the soreness, just being out there and seeing what my body, mind, spirit, soul, everything is capable of was just such a proud realization for me. It was also so amazing. One of the best parts of travel for me always is that it's always all about people. I loved meeting the Nepalese and Sherpa people and also the community of hikers and travelers along the way. The Nepalese and Sherpa people are so, so kind and giving. I loved learning about the Buddhist culture as well, where it's all the Buddhist philosophy, religion. The whole thing is about compassion and understanding and how can you show love and how can you show compassion and understanding for your fellow human because you are me and I am you. So I loved visiting the Tengboche, Tengboche Monastery. Mm. Um, it was very, very beautiful, very oh. enlightening. I read a book on Buddhism the entire trek and also was journaling all my thoughts and reflections and yes, learning that, learning compassion is key always was so beautiful and I also loved the community of hikers that we met along the way. Such amazing people. <laughs> And yeah, so in the end, to sum it all up, tips and advice that I would offer is that the total price of the trip, the total cost of this trip approximately per person. So we had our round trip Qatar Airways flight, which was 1800 USD from the flight route that I mentioned from LAX to Kathmandu. Travel health insurance was approximately 200 USD. And keep in mind, again, this is all per person. Payment for the private trek, just me and my friend, was $1,700 per person. And this included almost everything. If we got anything extra at each of the tea houses, like we wanted a dessert or we wanted more tea or more water than like the normal like one meal, one drink, then we would pay like a couple extra um, dollar rupiah for those. And then extra expenses in Nepal, like food, hotels, tips, helicopter, which was $500 per person, and massages amounted to $1,286. So the total approximate spending per person for this entire trip was $5,000. And so keep in mind that we were not making budget decisions. I'd consider this more of a luxury range of spending. Um, We were staying in Marriott's, getting massages. We had a private guide we booked last minute. So keep in mind, like hiking to Everest Base Camp is definitely an investment of time and money and, of course, energy. But it was definitely the most transformative experience of my life. And so thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions that I didn't answer here, comment them down below and I will do my best to answer. Again, this was the hardest but proudest accomplishment for my life. I would recommend not going for the ego, but if you feel a calling, I found that Everest is sort of like a dark, looming energy. It's the highest point on earth. There's a lot of energy circulating and happening there. And there are a lot of different reasons that people are pulled to conquer this mountain. I found that one is ego, one is pilgrimage, and one is like for the physical sort of like feet of it. I felt a pull from my ancestors on like anything I'd experienced before. And that was my guiding force for the trek. Um, And that's how I realized my physical body can do anything my mind decides if it's in alignment with the heart. And if you want to see the full vlog of this trek, like the raw, the real, the authentic moments, I will link that video here. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. My name is Mana Gafuri and subscribe, please, if this was helpful and share this with somebody that you want to hike to Mount Everest Base Camp with. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.